I, I was asked to, to speak about visual aspects of vestibular disease um, because many patients, as somebody say, they go to the wrong doctor if they have oscillopsia or they have visual vertigo, they can go to the ophthalmologist rather than to the ear or brain or brain doctor. So um, what are these uh, visual problems in the connection of uh, vestibular disease? One is oscillopsia. Oscillopsia means that the visual world oscillates, okay? Your vision seems to oscillate. As opposed to a, a very different syndrome, which we used to call visual vertigo, now it's called visually induced dizziness, um, which is when the patient's dizziness is triggered or made worse by certain uh, aspects of the visual surrounding. So in these cases, vision seems to go okay, uh, and these patients don't go to the ophthalmologist, but these patients can go to the ophthalmologist because their vision seems to bounce up and down or sideways. So just to start with one of these issues, visual vertigo can be defined as dizziness, which is triggered by rich or stimulating uh, visual surroundings. You will have heard many of your patients with vestibular disorder saying that the problems are worse than when they go into the supermarket because they have these flickering lights and there is too much optokinetic stimulation when they move and there are children moving around. All this visual stimulation is actually uh, uh, provoking of many of the, of the symptoms. Or if they watch repetitive fences or movies, traffic driving, moving things, um, that's what we call visual vertigo, and it develops in many patients with vestibular disorders. And I don't mean just peripheral vestibular disorders. Uh, I was delighted when Jeff uh, Stab was in our uh, group for uh, two or three months because we saw many patients with downbeat nystagmus reporting visual vertigo and visually aggravation of the, of the, of the symptoms. So this can happen in, in patients with all sorts of, uh, uh, and of course, that's for another discussion. It can develop in normal people as well. So how can it develop something like visual motion sensitivity or visual induced dizziness in patients with peripheral vestibular symptoms? Let me, let me just take you back through the history of what happens when you have, say, a vestibular neuritis. You will have vertigo, vomiting, nausea for two or three days. You'll be really wrecked for two or three days. And then you may have dizziness, shall we say, for two or three months. And then you may be left with what people call motion intolerance. These patients don't like moving about because when they move about, they feel the dizziness is coming back. So they don't like head motion, but at the same time, many of these patients develop visual motion intolerance. Now, I put it to you, if you were a little central vestibular nucleus neuron, standing there in the middle of the brainstem, and you have one input from the inner ear and one input from the visual cortex, that neuron knows very little about the difference between when you are moving or when the visual surround is moving. So from the point of view of an isolated neuron in the brain, it's very difficult to know if you are moving or if the world is moving. So if you have a vestibular imbalance and you have a degree of motion intolerance, it's likely that you will have head motion intolerance and visual motion intolerance. That is the 10 minutes explanation for this. And when that becomes prominent, we call it visual vertigo or visually induced dizziness. This is not a disease. This is not a disease. This is some kind of syndrome that can develop in many, in many uh, uh, situations. So, so many that over the years, uh, this issue of dizziness worsened by visual motion. This is the, el the oldest reference I have, but I'm sure Jeff Staff has found uh, references in the Neanderthal people inhabiting the north of Europe describing visual, visual vertigo. And, uh, and now we call it visually induced dizziness, and we are probably talking about similar, similar uh, uh, conditions. Now, where does it come from? Okay. There is an old concept by this American psychologist from the 40s and 50s, uh, Witkin. He developed the concept of visual dependency that he uh, um, ex examined in the normal population. He was really looking at university students. And he was doing Frankenstein type of experiments like this with normal subjects to try to see how people use gravity inertial cues 
vestibular information, proprioceptive information, tactile information, in, the, in contraposition to visual information to organize a special orientation. So when, I, when I'm tilted like this, do I know I'm tilted because of my vestibular system or more because of the visual system? That was the question that Witkin had when he was examining this. So what he had was a room that could be tilted like this, so the whole room could be tilted, or, and he had his subjects, normal subjects, normal subjects, seated on a, on a chair that could be tilted. So what he could do is this test. He would blindfold people like this. These are original pictures from Witkin in the, in the 40s. Um, uh, he would uh, uh, tilt people, and with the eyes shut, people will have to say well, when they felt upright. Okay, this is a, a subject, a normal subject here. Blindfolded saying, yes, I'm, I'm vertical. And you can tell because this is the direction of the gravitational vector. Now, this patient from Witkin, when examined, when tested, in the presence of a tilted visual surrounding, the patient got it, the patient, sorry, the normal subject got it completely wrong. This patient prefers to line herself up with the visual environment rather than with the gravitational environment. So in Witkin's description, this will be an extremely visually dependent subject. So I, I, I ask you, if you are a normal person like this and you get a vestibular disorder, then you have one system which is unreliable at fault, not able to tell your brain if you are upright or not because you've lost one labyrinth a, a, a year ago. And at the same time, you are ref dependent on the visual frame of reference. If you are in London and a double-decker bus moves in front of you, that person begins to feel that the person is moving. If you go to, um, what's this, this, this place, um, Bomarzo in Italy, where you have these tilted rooms like this, you will feel extremely dizzy. If you look at the Tower of Pisa, you will feel, so Italy is a bad place for visual vertigo, I think. So, um, why does it happen in peripheral vestibular patients? Why do people with visual vertigo um, uh, appear in a, in a vestibular a, a, a population? So I, I gave you the, the game away. Maybe is that some people with increased visual dependency to start with, when they get a vestibular disorder, they become vestibular patients with an additional uh, visual dependency, one on top of each other, which is a bad recipe. So, many years ago with Michel Guerras, we actually measure all of this. This is a, 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 a derivative, so to speak, from the original Witkin test. It's called the, the, from the original Witkin test, which is the rod and frame. People have to set the visual vertical line in the dark or against a tilted frame. Somebody who is visually dependent will tilt the line more in the direction of the, of the frame. But we did it as, as well as that, we did it in a dynamic way. So people here had to set the line against the background of a rotating disc. If you are very visually dependent, you will tilt the line more. And that's what we found in this patient with visual vertigo. And, and, and we did the same with postural. So, patients with visual vertigo get more tilted uh, when they are standing in front of a tilted frame, or they get more unstable when they, they stand in front of a rotating disc. So, this is a way of showing you the data, but I, I, in, in the interest of time, I will, I will cut that. Now, if you have a patient who had a vestibular attack, a vestibular neuritis, and has developed this visual sensitivity, this visual vertigo, you have to do something appropriate for that patient. This is what uh, Marusa Pavlo did when she was doing uh, her PhD with us. Um, a visual motion this is desensitization treatment in patients with visual vestibular symptoms, in, in patients with difficult uh, dizziness to rehabilitate. So it was a customized vestibular rehabilitation trial, uh, conventional good standard vestibular rehabilitation versus the addition of optokinetic or visual uh, stimulation. And we measure balance and we measure symptoms, which is, at the end of the day, what matters. Remember that most of uh, your peripheral vestibular patients, by the time they come to see you, they have very few signs. That's different to the kind of patients that we were 
discussing earlier on, Michael Stroop, with lots of eye signs. Those patients with central signs will have signs. The patient with peripheral vestibular uh, 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 lesions of a long standing, they will have very little, uh, very little signs. Okay, and this is the sort of treatment that you do. You expose them to all kinds of visual motion with this, with, with the horizontal OKN, okay or with virtual reality system, or with this cheap variety. This is, is a gadget that costs, uh, probably they're not on sale anymore. It costed uh, $200. Uh, I, I bought it in Japan many years ago. You just play movies through it, and the patient that does the vestibular rehabilitation, all the movements, while at the same time they get incongruent visual uh, motion stimulation through, through the goggles. And you find that these patients' general dizziness improves, but in particular, if you measure with questionnaires specific symptoms, like from this, from the Jacobs questionnaire, uh, what happens when you walk down a supermarket aisle, there is much more improvement in the patients who have the additional machine-based visual stimulation. So it's a, it's a good treatment for those residual visual symptoms that patients can have. And the rewarding thing of this particular uh, paper was that the psychological symptoms, the depression in, this, in these patients also improved much more when they were exposed to the visual motion uh, therapy. So it's one thing that one can do for these patients. So um, the conclusions of the visual vertigo uh, story is that Increased visual dependency is a component of this visual vertigo syndrome. So this is, is an abnormal kind of visual vestibular in, interaction, which uh, makes this patient highly sensitive to visual motion stimuli. The treatment, therefore, should be, should be aimed at promoting visual desensitization in, this, in these patients. And that you don't need complex machine to do this. We, we actually try to compare questionnaires and different techniques um, uh, experimental techniques, and with simple questions or questionnaires, you can diagnose this in your patients. What you can do is simply ask your patients who come to see you as a follow-up, what actually makes your dizziness worse? If the patient tells you, oh, it's when I lie down, I turn over, you think, oh, this patient may have some residual BPPV. But if the patient tells you, actually, when I go to the cinema and I'm sitting there with my husband, and, and then the movies, some of these car chasing uh, San Francisco movies where you see lots of movement. I can't, I have to close my eyes. And I used to be able to, to see those movies perfectly well. That patient needs this visual motion desensitization therapy. There's no much more science uh, than that. Now, um, and now to something completely different. I was going to talk to you about oscillopsia. Um, I don't know how much more time you think I should have. Five minutes, something like that? Yeah. Ten minutes. Well, I'll, 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 do it. I'll make it five. I'll, I'll do a good bargain so we can have some questions if in, to all the speakers. So oscillopsia is a different syndrome. It's illusory movement of the visual environment. If, if I have to be really simple, I would say oscillopsia is a much more serious symptom than visual vertigo. Nobody dies from visual vertigo. But if you happen to have oscillopsia because you have an annual carry malformation and have downbeat nystagmus, well, you might break your neck during a football match, and that'd be the end of it. So oscillopsia is a, is a worse symptom to have than, than visual vertigo, and the patients report movement of the visual surrounding. My algorithm to, to, to diagnose patients who come with a diagnosis of oscillopsia, and I tell this to ophthalmologists as well, is when the oscillopsia comes. If it happens, I'll, I'll make it simple and by way of questions. I, imagine you have a patient who tells you I'm okay, I'm okay when I'm stationary, but when I am moving, then I get oscillopsia. I, I see the world bouncing up and down. Imagine the patient is seated like that, it's fine, but goes on the car, and when the car begins to jump, they see the world bouncing up and down. What is the diagnosis in that patient? Bilateral vestibular failure, oscillopsia due to absent vestibular ocular reflex. If a patient tells you that the oscillopsia is due to particular head positions, imagine the patient say, I'm fine like this, or in a car, I'm mostly all right. But then, when I lie down in bed, I can see the ceiling bouncing up and down. A patient was telling me once, I can read the paper like this, but on Sundays, I used to like reading the paper like that, and I can't, because when I am in that position, the paper bounces up and down. 
So what's the diagnosis in that patient? Downbeat nystagmus, for instance. Yes? And if the patient tells you that the oscillopsia actually is not very related to, eye move, to, to head movements, the, the, you ask the patient, does it happen when you are sitting down watching the television? Yeah, the television goes like this all the time. And when you are in a car, yes, I look out and everything is going down. And if, if, and if you lie down in bed, oh yes, the ceiling goes up and down like this. What does that patient have? Nystagmus, exactly. If the room is moving, you know the room is not moving. If the room is moving all the time, you know that that patient has a nystagmus. Okay? So I'm, 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 with that, I'm cutting down 20 minutes of my talk. Uh, so this is the head thrust in one patient with bilateral uh, vestibular failure. Catch up a case to one side or the other. Causes of the VOR are many. A patient with positional downbeat nystagmus, you look, no nystagmus in the up, upright position when the patient lies down. The patient cannot read the newspaper when it's lying down because it all bounces up and down. It can stop, like in this case, or it can continue. And in that case, the visual problem is more permanent. Many ca cases of downbeat nystagmus. If the oscillopsia is not related to movement, it can be continuous or paroxysmal. If it is continuous, it's some kind of nystagmus, like the downbeat nystagmus that you've seen before. Remember to, that the downbeat nystagmus is more prominent in lateral gaze. Okay? The residents, the registrars always tell you, oh, come and see this patient with right beating nystagmus, and you look and actually is downbeating this time was exacerbated by lateral, by lateral gaze. Causes of downbeat nystagmus, always the same suspects. Then you have a, a, an Arnold Chiari malformation with cerebellar ectopia. Sometimes the nystagmus is very small. It can be torsional. Um, pendular nystagmus. This is the case I was telling you. If you actually ask a patient with a pendular nystagmus, they will tell you with one hand how they see the world like this. And why do they see the world like this? Because the eyes are doing that. Okay, all neurologists have seen this. How many ENT surgeons have seen this? Hands up. Doris, you don't count as an ENT surgeon anymore. <laughs> Few, and, and, and when they see this, they often think it's congenital, except that these patients usually had a good previous history of brainstem stroke or multiple sclerosis. Okay? These patients are virtually blind, not because they cannot see light, but because the world is going like this all the time. This is post-brainstem stroke where you have... And as, as you know, this actually, this nystagmus comes from interruption of the central tegmental tract. So the central tegmental tract connects the red nucleus with the inferior olive. And when you do quantitative MRI, as, as we did in the, in, in the 90s, you can see that the lesions sort of line up on the central tegmental tract, disconnected the inferior olive from the supranuclear control. And therefore, the inferior olive begins to beat at the natural frequency and drives the eyes and the lips and the, and the palate. It's always very rewarding when I see this in the ENT clinic. I see the eye, I get the patient to open the mouth and show the ENT registrar a pathology that they haven't seen, they haven't seen before, that the palate does, as I show you this here, the palatal myoclonus. And paroxysmal nystagmus, that's a separate lecture, but paroxysmal nystagmus and oscillopsia can come from disease from the labyrinth, eighth nerve, typically vestibular paroxysmia, brainstem, vestibular paroxysmia of a brainstem origin if in search of a better name, or cortical. Which of these is more, the more common of, the, of this all? Gut feeling. The cortex one, by, and by cortex I mean voluntary. Oh, sorry, this is not voluntary. This is voluntary nystagmus. The patient can, who can do it as a party trick, like this, like this normal person, 
You can see the eyes doing that. Imagine the amount of oscillopsia that comes with that. Or terrified, terrified teenagers discovering before their exams that when they try to look, the page of the book shakes like this. So many of these teenagers have MRI scans and, and all sorts of complicated neurological investigations where if you see one of these, you know. And if you don't want to see it on the screen, you can come and I'll show it for you. Uh, because many eye movement specialists can produce voluntary nystagmus voluntarily. So we, we just published a review in the Lancet Neurology on cranial uh, functional uh, eye movement disorders with some of the videos if you, want, if you want to read. So that's the summary of the oscillopsia title of the story. The treatment, the treatment of, of oscillopsia is difficult. If it is peripheral vestibular, the patient with no VOR, that patient can only improve with rehabilitation. If the nystagmus is due to neurological central nervous system disease, it, it, all these various mechanisms, all these various mechanisms have been tried for a successful treatment uh, of nystagmus. None of this treatment is 100%, uh, and I would say not even 50% proof, that's why there are so many treatments. For, for pneumonia, you only need penicillin. For nystagmus, you try one drug, doesn't work, you try another drug, you try, and, and actually, it's, it often is very frustrating. The more frustrating of them all is pendular nystagmus. Pendular nystagmus is a nightmare for the patient. The one that is effective is for paroxysmal disorder of any time, be that vestibular paroxysmia of the vestibular nerve or central lesions. Um, you can use carbamazepine. You do not use carbamazepine for voluntary nystagmus. Carbamazepine is a relatively toxic drug, and you, you have to use it when there is a specific in indication. Paroxysms of, vest of vestibular nerve or of uh, uh, brainstem origin. Okay, thank you very much indeed.